I want to take a look at the basics of setting up a REST API using Express and Node, building on things that you did in Web 3.2.2 and what we've just been discussing in our review of REST APIs and web services. So I want to look at some code from the Web 4.2.2 code examples. So in terms of getting this set up on your own machine, we put all of the uh, we put all of the examples up on, they're on GitHub, so you can grab them. And you've got two ways you can do this. So you can either go and download a zip file with everything, but the, the downside to doing this as a zip file is that if we update anything, like I updated a bunch of these yesterday, um, you won't get the updates and you'll have to download it again. So another alternative is for you to go and grab the URL to clone this thing. And if you open up a terminal, what you can do is you can say, when you have Git installed on your machine, you can clone this repository. And then you'll have access to it on your local machine. So as I said before, this isn't really a course on Git, uh, which is unfortunate. I wish I could, <laughs> I wish I had time to teach you more of it. But um, I've got this web 422 Git repository here, and it's got all of the code, all the same files that were on GitHub are here. If I ever wanted to update this, what I would do is I wouldn't clone it again. I would go into the directory where I've cloned it and I would say git pull origin master. And it will pull any updates that have been uh, pushed up to the server since the last time you updated your, your clone. And this way you can get access to the, um, the materials as we create them. So this week for week one, if you go into code examples week one, there are three different web servers that have been just little small web servers that I wanted to walk you through using and show you how to get them set up and how to run them and how we can interact with them. So let's start off with the web API v4. So every one of these little web APIs is gonna have its own package.json file, which is gonna define uh, all of the different dependencies and so on that I need. So let's just go in and uh, do this live. So I need to go into the code examples and week one, and I wanna go to v4. Okay, so I have package.json and I'll just open up a code editor for this as well. And I'll switch my screen around so that I can do multiple things at a time. Okay, so package.json has a number of things in here. So we've got all of our dependencies. So anytime you're gonna be doing any work with one of these APIs, somebody, either yourself or somebody else on your team is gonna to have to have defined these. And so I need to be in the same directory as my package.json and I need to install those dependencies. It's gonna go and download all of the things that I need, all of the dependencies. And the thing is, it's not just gonna install these two things like express and core. So if we just go in and take a look um, at node modules, and you take a look at what's inside node modules, it's installed a whole bunch of things. So there's actually, you know, as you would expect, Express is here and so is cores because we defined that we needed those. But then those have their own dependencies. And so all of their dependencies get installed and all of those have dependencies. And if you take a look at the package lock file, package lock JSON, you'll see the complete list of all of those dependencies and which version which version it needs and which things it requires, like all of the other things that it requires in order to functions. So it's really, you know, when you're installing this, you're, you're gonna get lots and lots of um, different things are gonna be installed in, um, in your node modules. And so, you know, defining this is, is only a portion of it. As much as you can, you wanna try and keep this list of dependencies down. So don't be afraid to work with things if you need them, but don't add dependencies that you don't need because those dependencies have dependencies, have dependencies, and it just makes for maintaining and keeping your software up to date a little bit harder. Okay, the next thing to note in here is that we've got a start command. So when we say uh, npm start, it's going to run the start command that we've got listed here. And in this case, it's gonna run node server.js. So if I run this, it starts up 
the web server. So you can see that it's running node, it's running server.js and server.js is over here. Or if you want to read along in GitHub, server.js is, is here. So let's take a quick look at what this does. So you can see that at the top, it defines a number of requires. It pulls in express, it pulls in cores. Cores is needed if you're gonna do cross-origin requests, meaning um, you, you, you are on a different origin, like HTTP, google.com is an origin. And so you're requesting something from one origin across to another origin. So you are on localhost versus google.com. Those are two different origins. The security model of the web is based on cores, is based on making sure that uh, data stays within an origin. If you request it, you can't leak it across origins unless it's explicitly allowed. So what's happening here with cores is cores is being pulled in and then cores is being enabled. So I can actually show you what that looks like. It means that a header gets added that says that this can be used cross origin. So we have a body parser, which is going to allow us to extract uh, and parse the uh, data in the body of a, of a request. We create an instance of Express, and then we set it up so that it defines which port to use. Now, this is really important. You'll see that it's using process.environment.port. And when you start deploying your apps, you're going to want to be able to have this be configurable by um, the environment. So on this machine here, if I were to say, um, if I said, let me make this a little bit bigger. My font is so huge. Let's see if I can make it so I can fit more in. Okay, so if I said port equals 8001 npm start, what that's going to do is it's going to define a environment variable and when it runs it, it's going to run this thing on port 8001 instead of port 8 8080. So you can see here it's now on 8001. So that's happening because we're we're reaching out to the environment and we're seeing if there's uh, something defined for port when it gets created. All the way down at the bottom, the app gets started and this is where it's printing out the message. So it's using that port in order to start up the app and what does the app do? So the app defines a number of routes, these endpoints that I have in my application. So for example, if I if I go to uh, localhost 8001, whoops. If I go to localhost 8001, I get back a 404. And if we tried it here, if I open up another um, tab, if I tried to hit this from, uh, from the command line, if I said curl HTTP localhost 8001, you see that I get back this cannot get. And if I asked for the headers, I get back a 404. So you can see here that the express server is sending me back a 404 and saying, I can't find what you're looking for. There's nothing at the root. So if we look at why that is, you can see over here in the code that we're defining these routes slash API slash items is where everything lives. So we should be able to do slash API items like this, and we get back JSON. Or if I do it on the command line down here, uh, let me pull this down. So if I curl uh, HTTP localhost 8001 API items, I get back the same. Uh, I get back the same data here. You can see that it's sending me back this JSON data, and that's because on the response we are sending back res.json is sending back uh, this object serialized to JSON for us. Now it's it's not doing it, but implicit in this call is a status call like this, like where it is setting a 200, because you'll notice that this thing, if I ask for the headers for this, you'll see that I get back a 200. So if I don't specify a response code, I'm gonna get back this 200 response, which is what's happening over here. Now we could try some other things. So another thing we could do is 
when we ask for all of the items, we could also console.log um, the requests headers. So if you wanted to see the headers that are coming into the server, let me stop my server and restart it. And let's redo, let me hit this API endpoint again. So if I were to refresh this and come over here, you'll see that it has now dumped out all of the headers that came in. So you'll see it has a whole bunch of information here. So for example, my user agent is here. Uh, let me just do this again so you can see. Okay, so like you can see that I'm running in Firefox 84. You can see that my browser has asked that um, I get back HTML if possible. You can see that I'm um, looking for English as my accept language, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this information is being sent in. The, uh, the Express app gets this data and it can decide what to do. So in this case, it's just sending back a response that says, um, you know, here's fetch all items. So we could send a different code if we wanted to. Instead of 200, we could send something like 203. So if I save this and restart the server, rerun this, refresh this, and if we take a look, uh, actually I can do it in uh, the browser as well. If we looked at the network tab, oops. Eight thousand and one uh, API items. So if I were to go to my network tab and I'll reload this and look at all, you'll see that here is what came back. So the response comes back, and I've picked um, two hundred three. So if you can see on the left here that I get back a two hundred three response. And if I were to do the same thing over here, if I were to request it you'll see that now I'm getting a 203 response instead of a 200 response. Well, I don't, obviously I don't want to do that. I want a 200 response, but I could do this. And if I wanted to, I could also not only read the headers that were coming from the request, but I could also set a header. So I could say on the response, what I'd like to do is I'd like to set a new header. And so I'm going to set a header of, let's say, x course is equal to web422, like that. And if I save this and restart my server, and if I refresh this and take a look at the network tab and look at this uh, here, and if I look at the headers, on the response, you'll see that I have a new header, X course web 422. So inside Express, I can work with the, I can work with the headers that are coming from the client. I can specify things that go in the headers in the response. I can set the body. I can set the status code for this. I'm working with URIs to be able to say, all right, well, slash API slash items with a get request is handled by this code right here. If I ask for a specific item like API items ID, so if I said give me number ID number 43, then it comes back and it says, you know, you're requesting item number 43. So I have a lot of control just through what we already know about working with Express to be able to define these routes and make it possible for us to build really powerful APIs where we can get data, we can get all data, we can get a specific piece of data. I want you to notice that in both cases, I name my URI the same. So slash API slash items. If I want all of the items or if I want a specific item, a specific item is always going to be, all right, you put the ID at the end of items. So you request all the items or you request the items slash whatever the ID of that item is. So I have a uniform way to define this. I can also make it possible to create new ones. So if I wanted to send a new item up to the server, I would post an, instead of getting on the HTTP re request. I can update something with a put or I can delete. 
if I wanted to delete an item from the server, I can ask for it that way. And if I have permissions to do that, it'll let me do it. Okay, let's take a look at the next server. So, uh, version five, I need to install this and I will pop open the code as well. Okay, so I have my server. Server does the same basic setup. So sets up express, cores, body parser, gets the port. And um, now it has, this server has a little bit more of a data source to it. So I'm gonna start this server, npm, uh, let's do it on uh, port equals 8001 npm start. Okay, so now if I ask for items, it gives me back something different. So you'll see here, here I have an array of colors. And when I ask for all of those, it's returning the array of colors to me. So we don't have a database here, but I now have some amount of data. I have something that I wanna be able to send back to the client and have the client be able to work with it. If I ask for a specific item, so let's say for example, that I ask for item number one, it gives me a response and says, we don't know what item number one is. If I ask for red, I get back, I get back red. So it, it, it allows me to request a specific item that's coming back, uh, coming back in from the server. And we could, we could improve this a little bit. So for example, right now, what do we do? We, we are looking inside of colors. We're trying to find the index for the item that was requested. And so it's looking up the index and it's, it's basically it's saying, um, let's make sure that whatever the user entered, request.parameters.id, we're going to turn that into lowercase. So really what we're doing here is we're saying id is equal to request.params.id. So we pull the id off of the uh, parameters in, so the user is going to pass it in via the URL, and we're going to pull it off of the URL. We have this id. We're looking for the index and we're looping through all of the colors. So here we could say uh, color is probably a better way to do this if it's equal to id dot two lowercase. So if those two match each other, then we have found the index. And then what does it do? So if the index is not equal to negative one, if it's greater than negative one, that means it was found. And then we respond with that item we give it back. If we didn't find it, then we're responding with a 404 uh, JSON. We didn't find it, not found. Okay, so we could respond here with something else. So right now we're expecting to get, so ID needs to be something like red or uh, red or red or something like that. It can be, so it should work for me to do red, it does, or if I do all uppercase, that works as well. But if I do the number seven, for example, that's unexpected and I get a 404. Let's make it slightly different. Let's do some validation. So let's validate ID uh, to make sure that it's a number, okay? Or to make sure that it's that it's not a number. Um, so we could we, we could we could write a little bit of code to say um, we expect this thing to be to look like to look like these to basically be um, to be a string. So we could use something like a regular expression here. So let's let's write uh, validate the ID to make sure it is a word, for example. So we could say um, if not, and let's write a little regular expression. So let's say that we want to do uh, A to Z and um, we want this to be, or let's say A to Z or A to Z capital. We want to have one or more of these 
and let's say that we want it to begin and end that way. So the whole string has to be letters, like these colors up here. And let's test the ID. And so if that is not true, so if you send in something that doesn't follow the pattern that we're expecting for our color, then we could return um, response.status 400. So we could send back a 400 and we could say JSON uh, message is invalid ID. And then we can return here like so. So now we've got three different things that are happening. Let's just test this code out. So if I kill the server, restart it, let's go up here and if I do this, you see that now I get a 400 response. So I get a 400 back and the message is invalid ID. If I give a color that isn't known, so if I say ABC, ABC is correct, but it's not found. So now I get a 404 like this. And if I ask for one of the ones that I know about, like red, then I get back, okay, yeah, here's the response that we get back. So we have lots of ways to work with the data that's coming in from the client side to be able to inspect it, to look at what's in the headers, to look at what's in the URL, to look at these parameters. We could add query strings to this. There's lots of ways for us, like Express is really rich in the way that it lets us interact with requests from the client and then allowing us to decide how we're gonna respond. So the way we're gonna respond is we're gonna decide what is the appropriate status code. So we gotta figure out is, is the client making an error? Is the server having some problem? Is there a server error? Is everything okay, 200, et cetera? And then we gotta figure out which data we wanna return back to the user. And we do that for all of these different ones. So you can see that when you're designing your API, your REST API is going to use these uniform resource identifiers and you're going to use HTTP POST, HTTP GET, etc. And you're going to use status codes to be able to determine did it work, did it fail, was this an error, and you're going to return JSON. So we're constantly going to be sending back pieces of JSON to the browser and the browser is gonna decide, okay, here's what I do with this particular set of, uh, of JSON. Okay, let's have a look at the last one. So close this and install the dependencies. And you'll notice that whenever I'm opening any of these web projects. I'm always opening the root of the project, like I'm opening the entire thing. I don't open a file. So sometimes when I'm working with students, they'll they'll show me how they're doing their work and they'll have, um, they'll just have one file open. Well, you can't work with a single file when you're doing the web. You have to have this whole project. So I want you to get used to opening up lots and lots of uh, files at once, like opening all of these. And, and what you can do is you can pop open all of your open editors. So if I have multiple files open, I can see them all. Okay, this third example is an API that has its own data layer. So in the past, what we had with the last one, let's just run this thing. Um, so this is theaters. There we go. So I'm sending back a richer data set this time. Um, I'm sending back the, if you look at the raw data, here's what's coming back from the server. All this data about different, uh, different theaters. And you can see that if I parse that data out, I have an array of JavaScript objects in here that have things like location information, everything has an ID, uh, a theater ID, street address, etc. So the way this is working is I am I'm moving my data layer into its own set of functions or into its own class. In this case, we have 
uh, something called server data. And server data defines a whole bunch of different APIs that I can call, which could be doing things like talking to MongoDB or making a request to another uh, service over HTTP or generating files or any number of things. So we are abstracting away the server. Th this server really should only be dealing with URIs, um, dealing with headers, dealing with validating parameters that are coming in from the client request, and then generating responses to go back, like generating uh, JSON responses to go back to the client side. What we don't want to do is we don't want to have this web server get cluttered with all kinds of logic for what's going on with the way that the app works. We don't want to clutter it with a whole bunch of um, knowledge of how the data layer works. So you want to try and abstract that stuff as much as you can. So we're starting to pull this apart and the and as our, our project gets bigger and bigger, we, you know, we separate it more and more. So in this case, all of our data lives in a, a JSON file. We've got a JSON file with all of the data, and this is, it's pretty easy to imagine this being a, uh, a database. So instead of having a database here, we're doing it just with static data from a JSON file. But imagine that we're opening a database, we load all of our data in, and then whenever we want to do anything, like get all of the theaters, we can work with that. In this case, it's cloning all of that data and then sorting it and it's sending back the data to the to the browser. Or if we want to get a specific one, it looks for a specific one based on the item ID. So like if I asked for this uh, theater, you'll see that I get back just that particular theater and not all of the other theaters. So we have ways of requesting everything. We have re ways of requesting just one of these. And you can see that in this case, it is looking for that one item that's in there. If nothing comes back, then we're obviously gonna need to return a 404. So if I change one number on this, right, I'm gonna get a 404. And the reason I get a 404 right here is um, this resource hasn't been found, like nothing. So when it, sorry, this is the line I want right here. Uh, my API is giving me back null. There's nothing there. There's nothing for me to work with. So I, I don't have anything there. But um, I can delete, I can post, I can create new ones. And so we would use this, and later on we will use this in order to be able to add items into our database eventually, or whatever it is. But we're going to abstract that away, and it's going to be something that's going to get handled by a data layer that's going to, this model that's going to service the rest of the web API so that it can handle things like connection strings and being able to work with the backend. But you notice that we're not, we're not creating any HTML. We're not creating any UI. We aren't, we aren't defining what our application looks like. There's no application here. What we have here is we have a service. We have this data that's available. The data is available over a set of standardized URIs. And so if you know how to request that data, you can get the data. The data comes in a structured format. So it's really easy to write code that can parse this and work with it. And then what we need to do is we need to build client side code that can request this data and can make use of it in the browser. So the last example that I have that I wanna build with you today is I wanna build a small little app that works with an API and dynamically creates a, a website without writing much HTML. There's very little HTML, it's all generated dynamically at runtime. So that's the last thing we'll do and we'll do that in the next video.